and welcome to our inaugural podcast. Today we're going to be talking about lipedema, and in particular my journey with lipedema. But first, I'd like to go and introduce you to my co-host, Phil Bird. Phil has graciously agreed to go on this journey with me as we talk about this disease. Hey, Don Ellen, thank you for having me here. How are you feeling today? I'm doing well. That's good. That's good. So everybody wants to know, honestly, and I don't even know this, what is lipedema? Lipedema. Lipedema is a disease of adipose tissue. Adipose is a type of fat tissue, and it starts collecting in women's bodies because it's a majority, if not 99.9% affects women. And it collects in their bodies, and it starts in their hips and their legs. And it kind of gives you, uh, it can misshape your legs. It can be painful, um, tiring. It can affect your mobility. Uh, it's, it's just a, a, an insidious disease for women. It, it can really affect you f- besides physically, but also mentally. Now, you've mentioned that it was, it was painful. It's painful. So I've seen, I mean, cellulite-looking legs. Is there a way I can, like, you can just tell? Or is it case by case? Uh, they, they usually end up, um, in, and of course it depends upon the stage you're in, uh, your legs start looking more like stumps instead of legs. So usually with a doctor who is familiar with the disease, they can look at it, and as soon as they see your legs, they can almost always tell. Uh, it's, it's very different than, like I said, it was a type of fat tissue. It is, um, it's like, it, you know, regular fat, number one, doesn't hurt, and it doesn't seem to have this... Uh, like a clumping feeling or feel like little BBs under your skin. Mm. And this does. And it, um, you can just kind of feel it as it goes through. So like little beep. So can you actually move each piece? It, it's like, a, it's like little beep peas or BBs and you can, you can a little bit, you can feel them. And in my case, now some women, and I think it may depend upon the stage they're in, said they don't have pain. Whereas I, I did, I do have pain in mine. I'm a stage two. It goes up to a stage four. Okay, so we're going to show the picture here of all the stages here. Yes, yeah, it's very telling. You can tell. Um, and you see how gradually as it goes on, your legs start not looking like legs anymore. You know, even at my stage, they start looking like stumps. And, you know, you can see where um, you get what they call sometimes they'll get cuffing around the knees where it's kind of like you have a little ledge. Mm. around your knees or around your ankles. And then it just keeps getting worse and worse. And if you notice as a stage four, you know, you can see how that would definitely impact your mobility and maybe just your everyday quality of life. Yeah, I would just imagine when you are those advanced stages, I mean, just getting up out of bed has got to be a huge hassle because it doesn't really affect the rest of your body. So you can still be normal shaped upper body, correct? Well, you can. Now, it can collect in any part of your body. But what happens is is it usually starts in around your hips and your legs. That's usually some of the first signs. You can get it in your trunk, like your abdomen. I have it in my abdomen. I actually actually have it in my arms as well. Um, So it can collect, but it really starts, um, my understanding, more times than not, and it certainly did for me, in the hips and the legs. So... As you go, and it keeps getting worse and worse, and they, the, um, the current thought is that this is triggered by uh, hormonal fluctuations. Hmm. So women can get it at different points of their lives. They can get it in puberty. They can get it at childbirth. They can get it uh, menopause, or uh, you know, I had a hysterectomy. So you know, you can get it at different anything that's going to go and cause sort of uh, those sort of fluctuations. For women, it just seems to make it, it, it exacerbates it. If you already have it, it seems to make it worse. Uh, it, it is, um, it, 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 it affects your, it affects your life so in, in ways when, that you don't think about. So when did you actually start seeing any initial signs? Well, and this is where it gets interesting because for many, many, many years, I was treated for lymphedema. And lymphedema is a different type of disease. It affects your lymph nodes and your lymphatic channels where it's trying to get that fluid up 
and getting it you know out out of your body processed and out of your body whereas this is a tissue disease uh, but they both have a tendency to cause some swelling and so during this say 15 years that I was treated for lymphedema mm. uh, you know you have to do you use um, compression garments compression pumps different things you try to conservative measures to try to go and treat say the swelling and everything of that well I noticed that as it went on mine became painful and so it was just more and more painful so for me going and putting compression garments and things on top of this painful tissue wasn't a great feeling it it, it was even worse it made it feel even worse for me um, but it took me until about four years ago to get a, a diagnosis or someone that was familiar, and that's a lot of the problem with this disease of lipedema, lipedema, is that a lot of doctors aren't familiar with it. So those four years, I mean, you didn't just sit at home in this way. You were actually trying to do, there was a process that you were trying to get because you knew something was different. It wasn't lymphedema because you were experiencing pain, right? Well, yes. I mean, I was still going through this treatment for lymph lymphedema, because that's what anyone thought it was. Um, I just remember one time I, I, for this particular doctor I was going to um, for a procedure on something else, and, and he did what what we are familiar with, which is like a, a pitting test where they press their thumb or a finger into your skin to see if it leaves a little pit and then how long it takes that pit to kind of fill up. It gives them an idea of how much fluid you're retaining. Well, when my doctor went in, pressed into to do this pitting test, it was really painful to me. And I, I, to the point, it almost brought tears in my eyes. And I asked him, I said, why is that so painful for me when you do that? And he said, I believe you have lipedema. Mm. And I'm like, wow, what? what? What is that? And then he happened to explain it to me. But I was fortunate because I finally ran into someone who who was familiar with this disease. A lot of times you'll hear from doctors that aren't because women who have this, as you can, as you may have noticed in the um, graphic, was they start getting bigger and bigger. And then doctors have a tendency to feel it's a, a disease of obesity or that you just need to lose weight. Um, and, you know, and let's be clear, this type of tissue and even though it is a type of, it's an adipose or a fat tissue, you cannot lose it through diet and exercise. It doesn't go away like that. Um, it, it stays in there until you have surgery to remove it. And it doesn't, you know, that's where this misconception or where doctors aren't familiar. I know that for a lot of women in the support groups I'm in for this disease, we all kind of battle the same thing which is this misdiagnosis, this misunderstanding, no one understanding the disease, or they call it lymphedema, and that's different, you know, affects a different sort of um, process in your body. It's not the same thing. And so they want to go and tell you these things that, you know, oh, lose weight, oh, exercise, oh, you know, try this diet or that diet. Um, you know, there have been you know, maybe some diets that might help with some of the pain or inflammation, but it doesn't get rid of that tissue itself. So how did it make you feel when doctor after doctor would say, oh, you just need to lose weight or, oh. or something like what was wrong through your, your mind when you're like, oh, man, I'm not getting the this is America. I'm not getting the help I, I, I need. Oh, yeah. It was so defeating. And so and ask any woman who gets told she needs to lose weight over and over again. You know, and, and like I said, that, you know, some of the women that get this, like if you are maybe younger or, or just, you know, you don't necessarily have weight, excess weight or anything like that. So it, it doesn't mean that you're fat, you know, to, to go and have this. And so that's not, it's not part of the equation like that. And it's just so upsetting. Yeah, and you're not, you're, I mean, I'll, you're not even overweight. <laughs> So it's 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 sad that a doctor would just kind of dismiss, you know, your cause because they just didn't know. Oh, you know? yeah. That, and a lot really of women disturbing. are recommended to go and have bariatric surgery. 
or whatever, um, you know, however they need to go and try to, to lose weight. And if you don't have a doctor that's familiar with it, then as a woman who hears that, you just go with your head hung low, you leave their office, and you go and try to do what they say. And then how sad is it when that doesn't fix the problem? Yeah, you kind of lose hope, right? You do lose hope. And it, it affects you so mentally, this whole thing, especially if you are like I like I was in pain. And and like let's be clear, you know, not all women have pain or or the level of pain. It just it just depends. You know, for me, if my son sat on my lap, it was painful. If my cat touched my leg, it's painful. Um, but if you go and you you do all the things you are told to do to try to help this situation and it doesn't it doesn't correct it. And then you don't have doctors that know enough about it. Yeah. Is this something that is uh is this disease? Is it like terminal? Can it can it's, it kill you? No. Or what, what's what's the it's what chronic, like? it's it's a chronic it's a chronic disease. And, and, and I, I don't know that we, if, if we didn't mention this before, if you think about this, these numbers that are associated with this, when it's estimated that about 11% of the female population of, of the world has this, that's millions of women, millions of women. And we all suffer these same sort of, um, you know, conditions and situations related to this disease. And in these, uh, like I said, the, the support groups that I belong to, you, you read the same posts, the same stories over and over again, no matter where you are in the world. And that you still are struggling, women all over are struggling with doctors being familiar with this disease. So I'm hoping that with this podcast and us talking about it, and talking to hopefully other women that have this, that you know the information is going to get out there, and educating doctors uh, that you know this this is a, a real disease. These are the symptoms. Please don't go and just you know disregard a woman or just tell her she needs to lose weight or you know go and get on a diet and you know and it's going to miraculously go away because that's that's not how it works. Yeah. Um, Keto ain't fixing this. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, you know, for me, you know, it, it's the ultimate um, solution is to have surgery. And I have already had my first surgery on this. I have one down. I have at least two, maybe three more to go. Uh, so it, it, and it's a process and it's phases. And it's, it's really the only hope, you know, you, you would be, it's just amazing to hear these women when they go and get a surgery date. It's like, you know, it's Christmas times a thousand. Yeah. So when you say you went through a, a process to, to get surgery, you know, you said 11% of the women in the world have it, you know, there's 4 billion women in the world. So that's about 440 million women. That's a huge thing. Um, I'm surprised I haven't really heard about this. Right. So let me ask you this question. Is it easy to get this surgery approved by insurance? Like, what are some of the, the challenges getting that approved? Because if I didn't even hear about it, I'm sure insurance has probably had a tough time saying this is a, a real a real problem for you. Well, it's interesting that you ask that because until recently, insurance didn't cover it. Um, a few companies, there was a class action lawsuit that was filed against a few companies about this disease. Um, the first couple, I believe they, they either settled or they were, or they lost the, the lawsuit because you can't go and take the only treatment away because the, um, surgery to go and treat this is liposuction and which basically the doctors, the surgeons have to go in there and just suck this type of tissue out without trying to damage, you know, other sorts of tissues, the other fat tissue that you have in your body. Um, so, you know, without causing more damage or maybe even more damage or just, uh, you know, uh, issues with your lymphatic system and make, if you do have lymphedema, cause lymphedema, cause some women can have both, but, um, that it make that worse. But the insurance companies that kept saying that liposuction was cosmetic and 
up until now that it, that has been the case and they haven't covered it. Nor are most plastic surgeons covered by insurance because a lot of their procedures are cosmetic as well. Well, now, you know, that that's totally different because now they've been told they have to go and cover this. You can't take away the only treatment that works for women with this disease. So now they've been told they have to cover it. Some have been better at others than covering it. Some are slow at adopting any sort of policies. Um, many, many women, um, from what I'm reading and hearing, is that they will automatically be denied when they are uh, they go to get pre-approval with their insurance company. What? Yeah, they're automatically um, denied. And I'm not saying that's all of them, so I don't want any insurance companies to come at me saying, we don't do that. I'm not saying all do, but... There have been many stories where they are automatically denied to begin with, and then they have to go back and have it appealed. Um, personally, you, you know, I got to wonder, do they just hope that the women give up then? And I, I, I don't know that some don't because it's a very hard process. It's a rough journey, and you can go back and be appealed and have that denied, and then you can only do that so often, and then before you're out of options – and you really need somebody in your corner or who has, or someone who has experienced this or knows how to work your way through an insurance company to try to get this done. And again, I'm not saying all are that way, but it has been a slow process to get this approved and get women, um, women treated. Okay, so let's, so let's talk about that because I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. Most people don't do anything past that first barrier. Right. They just kind of, oh, they said, no, I'm done. And a lot of times I just think it's just not knowing that you can go again okay. or how to go again, because in order to go and appeal, um, you know, my understanding is that, you know, you have to go and, and you have to provide further documentation and documentation that wasn't provided initially. Right. It's kind of like, you know, what's your new evidence here? What's your new um claim here that this this is needed that you need to have this and I think sometimes maybe um, women aren't experienced or knowledgeable in what that information may include or may need to be for them to go and get it through uh, you know a second round or even a third round because I believe most you can go and uh, appeal it a couple times and then maybe go for what they call an external review, which is going outside of the company itself. You get an external review company who has um, doctors who are supposed to uh, understand, have experience in that disease, be uh, board certified in their particular area, special area of expertise or specialty. And in this case, it's going to be plastic surgery and you want a board certified plastic surgeon. Oh, so yeah. not so even like a dermatologist can't make that um, decision for you, or so it has to be a plastic surgeon that kind of writes your diagnosis down for you. Yeah, you want to go and have someone who is board certified and someone who is, and and all, and, and let me say this too: not all board certified plastic surgeons are familiar with this disease. Exactly. So it is really, and, and this is the challenge for, and what I'm hearing, you know, worldwide as well as domestically here in the U.S. is finding plastic surgeons who are familiar with this disease. Uh, and you want someone who is so that they can go in there and they can, they, as they treat you and they go and do surgery, they can finesse it so that there's not damage to outlying issue, I mean, tissue, um, that they go and they do go in and separate this lipedema adipose tissue and take that out in a gentle manner that doesn't cause, it, it, you know, um, further swelling or injury or trauma to the rest of the tissue that's left, you know, in your legs or your. So why do you, why do you think insurance companies do the automatic denial thing? I mean, Let's play. Let's play devil's advocate here. Okay. Let's 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 be on the insurance company side for once. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Why? Uh, I I um, I'm not sure. If, uh, call it being on their side in this regard. Mm -hmm. It's if you think about that many millions of women, I think a lot of it 
is monetary. I don't, I, I hate to say that, but it's like, you know, that's a lot of money to pay for multiple surgeries in order to treat these women. And I, I have to think that, you know, that is certainly at the forefront of their thinking because then they have to pass on those costs to um, their companies who have to pass it on to their employees for higher premiums or, you know, however they have to go and recoup some of that because that is, you know, like I, I, I'm approved for three surgeries now. Um, chances are I, I will have to go for a fourth, and that's that's a lot of money. Yeah. So what about, okay, so you said you have to do four, four surgeries. I'm guessing there's different stages of the liposuction you're getting? It's on different parts of your body. Oh, okay, they okay. they try to uh, you know split it. Like I've had right now, my first surgery was on the backside of my legs, and my um, and my buttocks, and then the the second one's going to be my the front of my legs, and then I've got my abdomen, and then we have to go and review my arms because since I was originally um, had my first consultation and was officially diagnosed. That's gotten worse because that was a couple of years ago. So how fast how fast can you advance in stages? So here's the pictures again. How fast could this? How fast could you get from stage one to stage four? Well, and it depends because you know you're talking about those fluctuations. What are those hormone fluctuations? How drastic were they? You know, in order to keep building and building, and it, and it's just over time, it gets worse and worse. Um, you know, fortunately for me, I was at a stage two when I was diagnosed. And that's because I was lucky enough to find a doctor who who knew about it. Now, granted, I was seeing this doctor for something else totally different. Mm. And so he just happened to be familiar. And that I, that was fortunate on my part. And I'm, I, I, I am very, very lucky there. I, I had someone who find it, who found it. I was at a stage two, we could start that treatment women who are at a more advanced stage and it's taken longer to find someone who could diagnose them, then they, you know, they, they get worse. They had the, over time, the time has just taken its toll and they've gotten worse and worse and they've had all these fluctuations or continued to be, you know, exacerbated and their condition has gotten worse. So you, so you said that they have to be a, a board certified plastic surgeon, right? I mean, there's a bunch of those guys around, but, you know, we live in Central Florida. Um, how difficult was it to actually find a doctor that was familiar with your situation? Um, it was a couple things uh, I'm thinking about on that. Um, talking about the board certified plastic surgeon, there are doctors out there. I, I'm not going to to say that didn't have say a plastic surgery rotation or something who may be performing this. You know, I, my comfort level was with a board certified plastic surgeon and my surgeon, and I'm, I'm very fortunate again, I live in the same city as my surgeon because a lot of these women that I'm, I hear from globally, they are having to travel great distances sometimes to find a surgeon who can go and treat them. I was very, very lucky that, Thank goodness one of the better ones is right here in our city. So all I had to do was go 30 minutes downtown to see someone. And so, and he was, and he's very good at also body contouring because as we were saying, your legs get kind of, they, they're just misshapen and they look like stumps. So you want to go and get that shaped properly. Or if your skin has been stretched because of all of that collection of tissue, then you want to go and have someone in there who can excise that skin and, you know, go and get you back into a normal looking leg. I'm just so looking forward to having normal looking legs when I get through my surgeries and my abdomen as well. So I was lucky many women are traveling very far and because they need, they're desperate to find someone who is familiar with this and who can perform the surgery, then they may or may not, maybe, maybe he's not just a plastic surgeon. Maybe he is a doctor or he's a surgeon with a 
plastic surgery rotation. And there's whole different thoughts about that. Um, I can speak for mine. Mine is a board certified plastic surgeon who is very good at body contouring. I am fortunate and I know that. Okay. Well, I, I, this is very, very, very informative and I'm, I'm sad that you had to go through this, but I'm, I'm happy that you did go through this because now you can be an advocate for people who are going through this. And, um, lipedema, it's, it's a serious disease. I, I'm glad I'm, I'm learning about this. Do you have any advice for women who have just been diagnosed or let's say have been misdiagnosed with lymphedema or something else? Like where should their next steps be? Where should they go next? Well, I guess the first thing is don't give up and don't buy into everything you're told as in just go lose weight sort of thing. That's not how this gets treated. And to go and if you feel that something isn't right, if you feel, for me, I had the pain or a, a lot of another thing I, I forgot to mention is that um, there's a lot of bruising sometimes. You can just look down and you got a bruise and you don't even know how in the world you got it. So you bruise easily. So if you feel like you have some of these symptoms of this disease, do not give up. Try to do some research to find um, to find a doctor because I, I will tell you, the insurance companies, they not, they not only want a surgeon, they want a non-surgeon to diagnose you as well. Wait, why? Because there's the logic that maybe a plastic surgeon, maybe there's this idea that it's a monetary exchange, and I'm not saying that's, that's the case. Mm. Um, but there is maybe a thought there, but they just want more than one doctor, and they want someone to be a non-surgeon. And so you need to find someone who is a non-surgeon who can diagnose this. So they have to know about it. And then you have to have a surgeon. So you've really got two sets of doctors that have to know about this disease. That's two barriers there. It is. It is. Um, and I know that I had, and this is just in my documentation to get approved, and I had a hefty documentation package in my mind. And I know some women who've had many, many more pages than I did. Mine was like in the 60 page range. And I've heard some that are a hundred or more trying to, for the backup documentation to get the approval from the insurance company so that they can't come back with these questions or they can't automatically deny you so easy. Um, but I had to have, I had four doctors write letters that say, she's got this. She, she needs to have this done. And one was a, um, a doctor who was familiar. She's a non-surgeon who was familiar with the disease. So she wrote a letter. My family doctor wrote a letter. My vascular doctor wrote a letter. My surgeon wrote a letter. Um, now, I may have gone overboard on that, but it's like, here, here's four people. There's, there's no question I have it. I just need to get the treatment now. But you do need to have a non-surgeon, and you need to have the surgeon at, at a minimum. And, and prior to, you have to do what they call conservative measures, which are the compression garments, which are compression pump, which is manual lymphatic drainage massage, um, which are other ways. Maybe, uh, maybe you try to weight loss method or whatever so that they can discount that. But you have to show, uh, I believe most are six months and some maybe a little more of these conservative measures that said, listen, I did this and this didn't work. Got it. But I mean, of course it wouldn't work though. Right. Because it's, it's lipedema. Yeah. So. But again, you've got to go and prove to them that, you know, this isn't lymphedema. This isn't something else that you've got to, you've got to go and show that you've done something, um, that you've done all the steps so that you can just to go get this approved. It, it's, it's really challenging and it's frustrating. There's so the frustration level that you hear from women is, is it's so high because you just feel like it's an uphill battle. And I, I, I want to believe that in a few more years that the more the insurance companies are, um, you know, covering this like they do other diseases, you know, that they are required to cover that, you know, this, the education and the information is going to get out there not only for, you know, the um, 
patients that this is what they have that is going to be for the non-surgeons. It's going to be for surgeons. I mean, there are, I know my surgeon who I happen to be fortunate enough to have gotten into, I have heard that there is a huge 100 plus women waiting list just to have the initial consultation with him because finding a surgeon who is familiar with his disease and knows how to treat it properly is few and far between right at this point. But it's going to be a matter of education and information, and I hope that, you know, each each woman's story, and this is my story, but each woman's story is going to get us one step closer to getting that information out there and educating the the women and the doctors and the insurance companies and the and it's not only just doctors, it's your physical therapist that you have to see to get this done. It is nutritionists. It is psychologists. You know, it is a whole village, basically, of, you know, to, to steal that term, a whole village of people that you want to educate and who are going to be knowledgeable on this so that in a two or three years, women aren't struggling and fighting and and it's not taking the mental toll that it is because there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Wow. Well, I think that's a great way to end today's show. I mean, we've, 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 we've covered a, a ton of things based off of your own perspective. You know, there's obviously going to be more information. Um, you know, we're going to do a whole podcast about this. So I, I think what we're doing here is going to be fantastic. And I think for those who are watching, uh, if you have any questions, just go ahead and drop them in the comments or just comment on Facebook or wherever you're seeing this or wherever you're listening, go ahead and leave us a comment and tell us what you think. So uh, from Phil and Don Ellen Ray, we want to say thank you. And Don, do you have any uh, final words? No, no. Other than thank you. Thank you for listening. Please follow us so that you can be notified of future episodes and topics. I think we need to get this information out there. And each person that goes along this journey with us is one more person that has that information to share. All right. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you.